Okay, we're going to get started. Welcome. Um, I think we are also live broadcasting, so this is very exciting. Um, I'm going to apologize in advance for slightly clinking. Um, this is my special uh, necklace that says that I'm going to curse like within the first two seconds of this presentation. It's a Gloria Steinem quote that says, the truth will set you free, but first it will piss you off. So this is I'm clinking with my little necklace here that says that, so just in honor of this conference. Um, we are the panel, we are your bad art friend, writers on storytelling and truth. The description of this panel is up and we'll be referring to some slides. And we are in our title referring to a New York Times sensational article, Who is the Bad Art Friend, which we'll explain a little bit about in a moment. And in this article, it, this article examines the ethics of using others' stories, how writers, and, and so our questions are, how do writers use the literal truth to inform their storytelling? Which truths, if any, are off limits to writers? What happens when writers blur the line between fact and fiction? And can writers ever be your good art friends? These are questions we're entertaining. I will introduce myself and then we'll go around and introduce ourselves to you. I'm Rebecca Meacham. I'm a professor of English, writing and applied arts, humanities, women's and gender studies on campus, and I direct the writing and applied arts BFA. Oh, I'm also a fiction writer. I'm Julie Case. I'm an assistant professor of English and Humanities. I teach creative writing, literature, and theme writing classes. So I write primarily fiction, but also creative nonfiction, and I also do a lot of stuff in theme writing. And I'm Tara DeCraw. I'm a lecturer of English, creative writing, and writing foundations, and I write creative nonfiction, and that's what I'll be talking about today. Okay, so uh, to begin with, we will start uh, with discussing what is a bad art friend. We have a PowerPoint to go along with this. So the, uh, the term of the bad art friend started with the New York Times article written by Richard Kunkel. I can't see. Colker. Colker. Oh, Robert Colker. <laughs> That's what I meant. <laughs> okay. Anyway, it's a really great article. It's wonderful, work, really well written. And it described a situation that involved two writers and some contested material between them, but actually it was about a whole lot more. And okay, the first people. The first of these writers is named Don Dorland. And she, it, these, all of these writers uh, are located in the Boston area primarily. And Don Dorland is a writer and she's in a sort of lesser point of her career. She's not like a big, huge name. And she works at a place called Grub Street, which is a Boston-based writer collective that also offers classes and so forth. And in her work there, she befriends, <laughs> sorry, I thought I'd be thinking one more, one more, a woman named Sonia Larson, who is her colleague, as well as a writer friend, and what we should maybe assume is an art friend. Oh no, this will come up. <laughs> so during the course of their friendship, uh, it's conducted online, on Facebook, they meet in person, whatever. Um, during the course of this, Don Dorland uh, does one of these very charitable acts, which is she donates a kidney to a stranger. She does a, like, you know, there's uh, donations that are open. You can donate your kidney to whoever might need it. And so she's, Don Dorland's really excited about this, as one would be. This is a pretty amazing thing. So she creates a Facebook group where she invites all of the people she considers to be friends to keep up with her kidney giving adventures so she can write about them and talk about them as just a regular old human being, not necessarily as a writer. Sometimes I'm not so sure if those things are the same. <laughs> um, we'll talk about that in a minute. Anyway, so Sonia Larson's part of this group. And Dawn's pretty excited, proud of herself. And so she's posting in this group. And at one point, she posts a letter. We'll just say it. And this letter is what she has decided to write to her donor. And it's like, you can see it here. It's hello, this is, I, I, I donate this kidney. This is who I am. And by the way, these files are being pulled from um, depositions. Okay, so this is going to go somewhere pretty serious. So anyway, Dawn writes this letter. She posts it in the Facebook group and she kind of waits for people to reply and respond to her, like, oh, you're going to look amazing. Or, or kind of like, oh, she kind of waits for Sonia Larson to do this too. Sonia's curiously quiet. Time passes. 
Don Dorland gets wind that there's a story out there written by Sonia Larson. That, go ahead. It's about a person who receives a kidney from a very sort of self-congratulatory donor character in the original map drafts, also named Don, who in the fictional story writes a letter to the recipient, who is the main character of Sonia Larson's fictional short story. And you can see these letters, if you can see the screen, look super similar. So Sonia Larson's in this Facebook group, has seen this letter, has clearly taken this letter that Don Dorland wrote in all of her goodwill and put it into a story that makes a kidney donor look like an insufferable preening idiot. I'm gonna hand it over to Tara. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know, you probably can't see the text here. So I'm just gonna read a little bit for you. And then we're gonna talk about um, this idea of did, did, um, did Sonia Larson plagiarize this letter? So the, the original says, my name is Don Dorland. I'm a 35 year old white female and I live with my husband in LA. Um, and then in, the, in Sonia's version, it says, my name is Don Rofario. I'm a 36 year old white female and I live in greater Boston. So you can see right from the opening that there's, she made some changes. Uh, the, the person has a different last name. She lives in a different city, but she's basically taken this template and just, just changed a couple of things. Um, and then she goes on to, in the next paragraph, she says, the, the original says, in 2009, I read my first article about living kidney donation. And in the years since, I've been constantly reminded, whether triggered by my reading, I'm a writer, or through the stories of people I know of having the harrowing experience of dialysis and the dire need in the country for kidneys. Um, and then in the, the, the fictional story version, it says, in 2014, I read my first article about living kidney donation, and in the years since, I've been reminded constantly of the dire need for kidneys in our country. So, I mean, you can see, like, Sonia Larson has not gone to great pains to fictionalize this letter, to change the, the syntax of the sentences. Um, I mean, she's literally taking chunks of this word for word and putting it into her story. Um, is that plagiarism? I mean, I think we have a room full of like scholars and uh, English people. So yes, I mean, that's clearly plagiarism. Plagiarism, the definition that we teach at the university is you're um, taking someone's exact words without credit. Um, you also need to, even if you're paraphrasing something, you need to change the structure of the sentences so that you're not you know, mimicking their syntax, right? So the, the rule of thumb I give to students is two thirds of your, the words need to be your own. If you have more than two words that are exactly the same that you're taking from a source, you put it in quotation marks and you give credit to it, okay? That's, like, that's, the, that's the, the rule that we go by. So, I mean, it's pretty clear when you look at them side by side that this is a case of plagiarism. Um, but the legal definition of plagiarism is much more complicated than the academic version of plagiarism. Um, and then there, there's layered on top of this, this question of ethics, right? So did she get consent from, from the author of the original letter? No. Did she tell the author of the original letter that she was interested in using her story or her written materials? No. When she was asked, um, oh, sorry, when uh, Don Dorland asked her if she had seen her letter or heard about her kidney donation, Sonia, Sonia Larson just said, oh, I didn't know, I didn't hear anything about that. Like, so she, she lies on several levels about even being aware of the story, but clearly, you know, she has, right? Like, she's, she's taken things word for word. Um, I think one of the, the components of like a legal definition of plagiarism is that there has to be um, like a financial transaction that's taken place, like the person has to have suffered. Um, and, and that gets brought into the, into the New York Times article when we see that Sonia Larson won a prize and that she had published this story with Audible. Um, and again, when she was confronted by John Dorlin, she said, oh, yeah, I'm working on something, but, you know, it's it's still in progress when in reality it, it had already been published and she had earned money from it. 
So there's, there's just deception on many, many levels here. So when this article came out, I mean, it caused a huge stir in the literary community. It was the top story in the New York Times for a few days, and tons and tons of writers were responding to it um, on social media. I actually did a Zoom call with writers that I used to work with to talk about this article because like, we could not stop talking about it and thinking about it. Um, and there were, there were a lot of ways that people responded to the story beyond did she plagiarize or not? Who's the bad art friend or not? So like another angle of this story is that uh, Don Dorland, the woman who donated the kidney, was a little bit strange as a as a human being. So as she in the letter that she wrote, she talked about how she had suffered abuse and trauma as a child. She didn't like learn attachment from her family of birth. And that becomes really clear in the interactions that she has with these friends that she has on this Facebook group and in this writing community. Um, she's clearly somebody who is very over eager. She thinks she she assumes that Sonia Larson is her friend and that all these other people are her friends when they're really not. They're not really kind to her, um, but she she thinks that they're her friends. And so she gets kind of like doubly offended when this transgression occurs because she feels like her trust has been violated as a writer, but also as a human being. Um, and I think part of the reason why this resonated with, with the writing community is I think we've all kind of been in writing circles like this, where it feels like some people are the cool kids and maybe they're, um, they like, they're kind of clicky, they like to hang out, maybe they, you know, they congratulate each other and how brilliant they are. And then there's sort of like these hangers on that are like trying to like infiltrate that circle. And maybe they're in small groups together, they work together, but they're sort of like pushed to the sidelines. And that's clearly Don Dorland. But Don Dorlin doesn't totally get this because she's, she's got some, some issues that she's working through. Um, so that's kind of the undercurrent. And I think that's part of why this resonates with people. Like we, we understand the social dynamics of what's going on here. Um, and, and so the, the more you go into the story, you mo the more you see how they both acted badly. And it's hard to know like who you're rooting for and whose side that you want to take. Do you guys want to say anything else about how it went viral and the reaction people had? I would like to just say that just quickly that the bigger context for this also is, I mean, this is going to tell you a lot about how horrible writers are, many of them. Okay, I would include myself sometimes in this category too. The bigger context to this is um, prior to this, there was a story in the New Yorker that was called Cat Person, and that was supposedly based on somebody real and uh, living that had a, had a story. And so the woman who recognized her experience in this very big New Yorker story from years and years before, about two months prior to this all breaking, had published an article saying, hey, that was me in this other story. And so all of the buzz and writer Twitter, and remember writers are supposed to be working all day at a keyboard, but they get distracted and they go on Twitter and they have a lot of opinions and then they go back. So writer Twitter is very, very active and there's a lot of opinions and things flying around a lot because we're supposed to be <laughs> writing and that can be boring on um, any breaks. And so writer Twitter was all of us already about the ethics of using other people's lives and stories as um, inspiration, if not verbatim, in actual stories that they are writing. So there was this greater context already going on about what are the ethics of using other people's stories? And there were already camps set up about this kind of thing where it's like, we're thieves, that's all we ever do, get over it. And then there were, I mean, what do you think writing is? And then there were other people who were like, well, you know, that's not cool. Or, you know, this, there's actually a living person out here. So this all kind of comes at a time when there's already a lot of, of discourse, as they like to call it, um, going on about the ethics of using other people's stories. And I guess the other thing that's kind of important to point out is the element of race and the way that that plays into the story. So the thing is that Don Darling is a white writer and Samuel Larson is a writer of color. And when she used Don Darling's story in her piece, it was a story about I think a Chinese woman who receives their kidney donation. And it becomes a narrative about white saviorism in a larger context of race in, in society. 
And so on some level, I think you can say that that's a story that Don Dorland couldn't probably have written about herself. And that was probably not an angle of herself or her identity that she was aware of in this instance of kidney donation. So a lot of people were saying, well, why are you posting so publicly about your kidney donation? Why do you want to be celebrated? And so Sonia Larson took this and put it in the context of race and her own experience and thinking about, you know, what does it mean to live in a world where people are very um, publicly demonstrating how great they are? Um, and what does it mean to be a person of color and maybe refusing that or stepping back from that? And I feel like the line that is drawn is, is of course, the very clear use of Don Norland's letter. I mean, that's not just plagiarism, it's also kind of lazy. Right? Like, why can't you just write your own letter? It's not that hard. And then I think, too, what some other people have pointed out, that undercurrent of when Don Norland did a lot of the legal work, she had to really work hard to, I guess, basically sue Sonia Larson and kind of work through these legal things. All these emails came out where Sonia Larson was talking to her other Asian writer friends saying all these terrible things about Don Dorland, who thought that these were her actual writer friends. Um, and I think that as people have pointed out, that is such a common thing. I, I, as I was reading this article, I was thinking about all the times, you know, writers talk about like, oh, the person is the better writer, and oh, this person has gotten success and they don't deserve it. And there's just so much, I think, insecurity that's based on. You know, how successful you are and what happens to your work. And a lot of that stuff is kind of luck too, in some ways. And so I feel like that really played into it. I feel really bad for Don Dorland that she had to see those emails. Um, I know there's probably emails like that about new places, and I don't know if I never see them. <laughs> but I think mm -hmm. it's a really complicated issue, and it is, I think, very hard to, to say, like, one well, person. I don't think anybody acted well in this scenario, but I also don't know that it's possible as a writer to act well in this kind of situation. So one other thing I would add about the racial dynamics of this story is, um, you know, so this became a legal case, right? So Don Norlin was suing Sonia Larson for taking her words without her consent and profiting from them. Um, and then as, you know, as this escalated and people started, you know, getting involved and competing with each other and um, the, the publisher, like this story got picked up a second time um, by Rub Street in Boston. And, um, and then uh, this plagiarism, like pending legal action came to light. So Don Norlin wrote to Grub Street and said, hey, by the way, do you know that I'm suing her for plagiarism about this story? And so Grub Street was going to, I think, yeah, there's a book festival. They're going to distribute like a thousand copies of the story or something. And she was getting, Sonia Larson was again getting paid for the story and they, they pulled, they pulled it. They said, we're not going to do that. We can't get involved. We can get sued. Um, we can be financially responsible. And so then things escalated and some of Sonia Larson's friends, including a very famous Asian American writer named Celeste Nick, who wrote uh, oh, um, a couple books. <laughs> Little fires everywhere. Little, everywhere. Thank you. Um, she she got involved with with the, these email exchanges and she um, tried to make this an issue of of like a white woman taking something that an Asian or a woman of color had earned um, and so she was trying to say that this was like a racist act on Don Dorland's part and that really rubbed a lot of people the wrong way they're saying don't make this about race like you stole something from her so it was it just it became very very uh very messy and um to sort of follow this up so that, that what, how this particular story ends is that it's still in progress and so what ended up happening at least that you can see on this slide is that that boston book festival said basically forget it as as carol was saying um, we're pulling this and quit, you're, quit, quit having your influential friends uh, talk to us, Sonia Larson, we're taking the story out. And so there was a financial loss to Sonia Larson, in addition to her reputation, which um, Don Dorland was writing lots of uh, other places where Sonia was on the um, marquee or on the billing and telling them about this. Um, but in addition to that, there's lawsuits and counter countersuits. There's all sorts of horrible stuff coming out in the discovery, which is, of course, where all of these files and chats and stuff are being subpoenaed. But also for Grub Street, the writer's um, place of employment, this place that runs workshops and does all this great stuff in Boston, they actually had an entire, like, a huge change in leadership and their board and lots of turnover. Because in the heart of this also is this is an HR issue between coworkers. 
um, who well, both were employed by the same place. So it's about as messy as you can possibly imagine in terms of the fallout. So a lot of things have happened with since then um, and are still in progress and who knows how this will all work out. So I guess what, what we were interested in was what this says about us and as writers and what this says about um, the greater ethics of all of this. So we're gonna go through how, how we would like to talk about this, just sort of one of the center it around this, what we're talking about by that, our friend. I think Julie had the first um, question that she was gonna ask. Yeah, I just, I guess, so to kind of summarize, I feel like some of the issues that I think we can take from this is one, you know, the sort of the larger question about art and what inspires us and what we can use in our art. And especially when you think about how writing is often taught in workshop communities. And I think part of what happens when you're writing in a group like that, and then it's sustained, that a lot of times you have these collective ideas that kind of percolate. And I can think of a lot of experiences from my own workshops where people maybe accidentally took lines just because writing is incantatory, right? It's meant to be remembered. And part of that has to do with rhythm and sound. And so you really absorb those things and you may not know where they came from. And so that's obviously super different than copying someone's letter word for word, but I think it is something that happens in writing communities, and it's not something that I've heard people talk about a lot before. It's like, what are the lines between, like, what happens if, if someone like accidentally uses something, and how do you how do you kind of know those sorts of things? And then I guess the other thing I just wanted to talk about is like this is I'm thinking about this a lot is I went to a panel like 15 years ago where Michael Martone, who's this experimental writer, it was an experimental fiction panel, and he asked ask the question like what is awesomeness in terms of public ownership and basically he gave this example of like and there was a number that i wish i could remember and i tried to look it up and i could not but he said that if a person is known by a certain number of people then they basically become publicly owned and so we are all welcome to use them in our fiction so the example he gave was colonel sanders a real person you know obviously a commercial icon but we can all go and write fiction about colonel sanders and we don't have to worry about like actual colonel sanders and his life and those kinds of you can think about stuff like Lincoln and the Bardo, where you took Abraham Lincoln and put some ghosts in there. You can think about like Abraham Lincoln's vampire hunter, right? Like there's lots of examples of people taking real things and making art out of them and it kind of being okay. And so the question is like, where is that line? So he says, you can write about Colonel Sanders because he's kind of publicly owned, but you can't write about Colonel Sanders' mother, right? Like you don't know much about Colonel Sanders' mother. She's off limits. So I think about that a lot, right? I don't, I don't know where exactly that line is, and we did have this number, but I feel like even then, how do you know the number of people that know a certain thing? Anyway, so I'm going to get to the first question. Wait a so, second. Oh, yeah, I please. just want to write about Colonel Sanders' mother. Now. Yeah, no, <laughs> let me tell you why. So this is where this becomes irresistible, and that is because there is a no. I mean, as a writer, and what I want to know and think about. There's a known story or a purportedly known story or a myth of Colonel Sanders out there. And again, if you don't know this, this is a chicken, a fried chicken icon. So like not everybody, if there was a Taco Bell thing, it might be more of it, but there's not a character I could say the Taco Bell. Um, and so that's, that's that, but the untold story of Colonel Sanders' mother is enormously appealing for me to want to know about, and, and that's part of the writerly curiosity, right? So that's, that's part of the sort of difficulty here about those ethics to me is, well, of course I want to read or write that story. Of course that's fascinating. Like how would we ever think about, maybe not, maybe she could be totally boring. She could be like, you know, rejected a million recipes and then Colonel Sanders figured it out that it's 11 secret spices or whatever. And it's a very boring story. But that just seems to me like, then what do you do, right? The other thing that I think is interesting about 15 years ago, Michael Martone is, what we're talking about here is in the Facebook group, um, which, you know, where are the limits then when something is known, not just through a conversation in the bar or a conversation between people, or don't tell anyone I told you this, and then you can write it in the story. But I'm in, you know, you're one of the 100,000 people or 1,000 people I have in my Facebook group celebrating my kidney donation. I'm not saying that it's cool to take a letter and put it in the story, but I am saying, what does that say to that? that level of anonymity or knownness, right? It changes that dynamic now that there's social media and people are seeming to self-disclose at greater, like are they a known figure? So I would just add one thing onto that and then we'll get to our question. <laughs> um, Jen Young gave a humor talk a couple of weeks ago and she talked about one of the cardinal rules of humor is that you punch up, right? You don't 
make fun of people who are weaker than you or below you. And I think that there is an element of that that we can apply to this too. Like, I mean, if people are famous, you know, you're punching up, right? Like you can write about them in lots of different ways. It doesn't mean their feelings might not get hurt, but you know, they have more power than you do. Um, Colonel Sanders' mother, like, you know, she's maybe not more famous or isn't more powerful than you, but I think that your intent and what you write about that person really, really matters. Yep. And I think that's where the bad art friend story it becomes very clear who the bad art friend is, at least for me, because I think that Sonia Larson um, was punching down. Like this is, she was stealing from someone. This is someone who had a, a like a lot of trauma in her childhood and was clearly like socially like dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. And she really took advantage of that and she lied about it on multiple occasions. And so to me, she's punching down in so many different ways that, you know, what she did was just morally and ethically completely wrong. And I think, too, the title of that article isn't like who owns the story. It's who's the bad art friend. So even that article and then all of the, the conversation that came out around it was about what do we think we can trust in a relationship with other people? And then what if that other person exploits it and becomes it's a notoriety off of this, you know, can you tell a writer a secret? Can you tell a writer anything? Can you be around a writer? Can you even be known to a writer? Because they're going to, they're going to write about you, even if it's your cousin's grandfather, and there's this awesome story. It's like, oh my God, that's amazing. They're going to, again, maybe I'm showing too much of myself, but I would be like, wow, that's a great story. It's got to be told some way. So I think that friendship or that bond that you think is also really central agreeing with you here to the whole conception of this as ethic, all the ethics that are wrapped up in that situation. Yeah, I agree with that. I was thinking about that punching down thing too, because absolutely, I feel like it's almost Berlin is less well known. And also like just like me emailed that, that, like that really pinned me wrong. I feel like that was the worst part, even though that's like the most normal thing. <laughs> like it clearly wasn't done in a spirit of, of you know, ethics or thinking about responsibility to a person. Yeah. But then I was just trying to think too, like, okay, say I wanted to write a story about Kim Kardashian, like Kim Kardashian Vampire Hunter, and say I wanted to take a tweet that Kim Kardashian put out and put it in the story. I guess, like, I guess I could do that, sure. but I would have to, to attribute it, which as you pointed out, is not a thing that could happen, right? It was just used basically word for word without any intention of it being the word. I don't know about that attribution part. So I'm going to give you a little bit of other thoughts. Oh, it's such big gossip. You got this is terrible. And I know this person, but I won't name them. Um, but it's, it's interesting to me. So, when you sign a contract with a publisher, you are signing away, you, you, you are saying to the publisher, I'm going to say that all of this stuff I have the rights to, and I'm allowed to use this. And now, not, I don't know what other publisher contracts look like, but I can just speak for university presses because that's where my first book comes from and then also where the book in question that we talk about comes from. So I went to school with a guy and um, he won the Flannery O'Connor Prize for Fiction, which is a big freaking deal. It's huge. And it's a short, it's, it's the press, I think it's University of Georgia Press, offers this prize once a year to a collection of short stories that was previously unpublished to get like some like for short story collections, it's, it seems like a lot of money, like fifteen thousand dollars, which is really not a lot of money, but it's like. Ooh. And then your book gets published by the press, and this is a really prestigious press, and it's a really big deal, and you really want to win this. Having lost it, you know, not won it before, I'm totally like, like, oh my god, good for him, good for him, right? Really kind of bitter about it. But anyway, in this person's book was material that came from a memoir. That was um, oh it's gosh I'm gonna I'm gonna start selling out it has to do with um oh, I'm blanking out on the guy but it was in the 1920s and it was a person who um, went to Klan meetings and um, like wrote about what it was really like in complex Klan meetings so in this book is a story that takes a lot of the text from that and so forth my and author and person pardon Stetson Kennedy. I don't know. It's like it's like stars fell on Alabama. Or, you know what? I, I'm looking at David. Like David, you might know, but I'm just putting one. Yeah, on. I don't remember that title. Yeah. Well, anyway, it's, it's anyway, it's it's sort of famous where he was from in the South, but then other people. It might be Mississippi. Anyway, somewhere they you know this is about this thing. Anyway, signs that contract. Yes, I write to all this stuff. Uh, a a librarian, always librarians are the heroes of every story. <laughs> librarian sees three. Early publication of this book and recognize. Oh, Carl Carmer, 
recognizes Carl Carmer's memoir in some of the language and so forth. And University of Georgia says, you don't have the rights to this. You never told us about this. And then they did this thing that sounds so violent. They pulped the book, all the copies. When you think of that, they turned it back into pulp. They were so mad. That's a big deal. Like the publisher doesn't like to do that. So anyway, this writer now lives in like literally like Bohemia and has a totally different career and is doing things there because that was enormous. And that writer was saying, trying to make this case that it was intertextual, that I was being postmodern, which is an argument that you can try to make where it's sort of like in like a music sample being reused and repurposed for some other artistic purpose. He was saying, no, 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 no. It was being postmodern. I, I changed it just enough. And, and it, it was clearly a very lazy version of that if that was indeed the higher thinking that was going on there. In any case, so I guess what I'm saying is, is going back to like what you need to have rights to, I'm not sure, and I also don't know where who's checking on that, right, and who's damaged. But Carl Harper was a famous guy, so like that memoir was known. So was he damaged, or was it wasn't the statement or not? Anyway, that's just another story of like those repercussions of using a truth or using something that you think you might be authorized to use, and the press is like, okay, if you say so, and then the repercussions. I'm sorry, that was just a bit of a tidbit for you. No, that's great. Are you already the question? Sure. So y'all can think back on how many of these you get, but the first one is, in general, do you feel that there are certain stories or topics that should be off limits for writers, and in what ways? How has this issue influenced your own work or approach to writing? I think we sort of talked about punching up and punching down. Yeah, actually, I have a book that I want to talk about related to this, which is um, Catherine Harrison's The Kiss. This is a memoir that came out, oh, I don't know, 15 or 20 years ago. And so it's a memoir, so it's a true story, right? Um, and it's a story about the author's adult incestuous relationship with her father. And just knowing what the book is about and not having read anything about it, a, a lot of people, when it came out, were like, uh, why are you writing about this? I don't want to read that. Like, don't go there, right? And so I think that's a really good example of a topic where a lot of people are just, like, there's this yuck factor. People are grossed out about, about it. Um, but the story itself is incredibly important. It's incredibly beautiful and moving. And just, I think, essential for the culture. Um, and so the, the, the short version of the story is that she, Catherine Harrison grew up not knowing her father. Um, she, and, and she, her mother died when, she, her mother like sort of abandoned her and then died when she was young. And so she was raised by her grandparents. And she got to know her father as an adult when she was about 20 years old. And she had built him up, she had built him up in her mind as this sort of like savior person. And when she actually met him, and at, at, at this point he had become a, a minister as well, um, she like, she just had this, you know, godlike image of him, like, and, and the fact that he wanted to know her and have a relationship with her made her feel like really loved. And the first, in, in their first meeting, um, they, they, they get together for the weekend and then she drives into the airport and then he kisses her goodbye and puts his tongue in her mouth. And she's just like, she freezes and she's like, what's going on? What just happened here? And she spends the next several years like trying to make sense of this and like, maybe it didn't happen or I misinterpreted it. She, she, she goes around and around trying to make sense of it. And then a couple of years later, she um, starts to see him again and they end up having this incestuous relationship. Um, and he's becomes very, very controlling with her. I mean, she's a very vulnerable person. Um, she's des desperate for a relationship and for love. And she sort of feels like, well, I can't say no because then he won't love me, right? Um, and he becomes very controlling and he says, um, basically like, you can never tell anyone this because you'll be ruined. And you can that no one will ever love you like I love you. He becomes very like just like extremely manipulative. And so she's basically being told by her father and by the culture that you can never tell this story. Right. And so writing the story for her, like many years later after she's married and becomes a mother, 
and has, you know, doesn't have a relationship with her father in any capacity. She says, like, I didn't write this story to out him. I wrote this story to understand what happened. Mm -hmm. um, how could this have happened? What was my part in it? What did, what was his part in it? Mm -hmm. um, and again, I think there are other victims who experience things like this. And to have a book out there that gives them a roadmap to understand this is just incredibly valuable to the culture. And again, it's, it's not written as an expose. It's not written as like a, you know, like a car crash scene that you, you know, you have to watch because she gives you all these gory details. It's an excavation of how could this have happened? And, and what do I do? Like, how do I, how do I not just kill myself mm -hmm. um, and, and come out of this? Because that's where she kind of ends up. She ends up like very suicidal, um, but obviously eventually recovers from it. So that would be the kind of story that I think people say you shouldn't write about, but I would say as a memoirist, it's incredibly important to write. I think for me, I, I feel like this question is an incredibly personal one, and it's one that you, I think, have to make kind of answer for yourself. But I think that it is important to answer it for yourself as an artist to sit down and say, okay, what are my limits and, and why? And then to think about them when writing. But I feel like for me, it's often related to things about representation. So I was thinking about that novel, American Dirt, which you may have heard of. It came out in 2020. I think the author's name is Jamie Cummins. It's basically a, a white woman author writing about undocumented Mexican um, experience, immigrant experience. And basically when this book came out, a lot of people said, well, this is an important story, obviously, but this author should not be the one to write it. I'm um, saying that it is exploitative and appropriative, like that all of the things that say. And I do feel like I kind of fall into that camp. On the other hand, my mother read that book. She's a librarian. She thought it was like the greatest book she read of the year. But I don't know. I mean, it, it's important, I guess, to raise awareness of those issues, but I don't know that I'm the one to wear, raise awareness of issues with by people of color. That said, though, I feel like as writers, we do have a responsibility to make sure that the work we create are as diverse as the actual world. And what that means for me as a writer is sometimes writing outside of my comfort zone, just saying, right, I need to represent people of color, I need to represent people who are different for me in order to make my world believable and engaging and cool. Um, and so what do I need to do to do that? And I know this is something we talked about in my you know, intermediate fiction class quite a lot, so you guys need to work with and be on this later. And I guess the other thing I should mention too is, I, I think I forgot to say this at the beginning, so we kind of thought of each other as representing different genres, and so for my genre, I'm representing speculative fiction, which is, you know, things like fantasy, science fiction, or things like that, magical realism. And I feel like, especially in terms of speculative fiction, diversity is such an important issue, and it's something that's often neglected. I, one of my biggest pet peeves is watching a fantasy movie, and there being like boring armies, and they're all just male, right? It's like, can we please get some female orcs in here? They don't have any lines. It doesn't matter. Like, just make some female orcs and put them in the book. He's like, can we just do this? And there are a lot of debates about this if you think about something like the Hunger Games, right? Which is meant to be this extension, this future of America where there are different districts. But if you remember when they cast that film, people were really upset about casting you as a person of color, even though it's clearly in the book. And I feel like there are some issues of race that are kind of problematic in that book, right? In that if you think about the way that race is depicted in the film, and it's meant to be futuristic when you think about discussions about minority majority, which are coming, right? It's like if you're writing about the future, probably it's not going to be all white people. Like it's just not. And so if we're writing about the future, if we're writing space opera and science fiction, like we really need to think of the diversity. I think it's super important, even if it makes us uncomfortable. And the other thing, too, I think that's nice about speculative fiction is that it does give you a degree of distance. So it makes it easier, I think, sometimes to talk about those things. Like I was thinking about the bad villains, I know Larson thing. I was like, if Claudia Larson had written a science fiction novel about someone donating a tentacle, right? Like, <laughs> would that have had the same effect? Like, right. Would that women have been a little more willing to sit with it? I, I don't know. And it, but I, I feel like the story that Sonia Larson was writing was really rooted in contemporary experiences of race and conflict and those kinds of things. And so probably not a great topic for a speculative story, but I, I do think it made me think a little bit about what speculative writing affords you in terms of leeway and that kind of thing. As you guys are talking about, this is so deep. And so I'm just going back and forth and, and thinking about, I love what you say, Julie, about a person in power, cultural power, being very careful or just simply not trying to speak for experiences that are marginalized or silenced, right? So like a person of color, like, and I, I, 
I, but, but at the same time that I'm like, yeah, I totally agree with that. I know that's a really like, there's lots of talk about this in the writer community and what you're supposed to do and should you be more ethical about your white person should you write in any other type of experience. And yeah, one of my experiences as a writer that I found so rewarding and what, what I hope would be affecting to other people, and they're also talking about writing that gets published, which is a whole other thing. It's not just writing it because it's good, but writing it because you want people to read it. And the market has said it's worthy of that. Um, was a story that came that was inspired, a really tiny little story, and it was set in an Indian boarding school. And the only reason that I did that and, and was writing from the point of view of um, young women that were stuck there and being abused there was because I had found a primer, an 1870 like primer in a vintage store. And it was all about exercises for printing and writing and the ways that the sentences were kind of going together were really interesting. And I felt like they were trying to tell a story like we dine at nine and then there would be the, the time of a board is, and it was, and I was like, what's, what's the, they were just random work to help people practice verses. But I was like, what's there? The story started for me in that language and something going on between those lines. It didn't start at an Indian boarding school, but I felt like what I was trying to do was write the experience of a group of people who were like the intention felt in tandem with the actual experience. I wasn't trying to propagate. And at the end, uh, any kind of myth about what that was like or sugarcoat it. And at the end, the girls escape. And, and it's all expressed in this language of a primer. Now, that had a very limited, tiny little life in publication. If it had gotten bigger, I would have to, I think, address questions about where I'm positioned in that. And so there was a bit of a safety in, in the fact that this is small and it was big. But my ethics, I feel like, I don't know. I feel like I was trying to show something that hasn't been told as commonly as I wish it had. I didn't feel like I was being a savior because I was genuinely curious and I was genuinely like empathetic, but I can totally see how my genuine, my goodness, right? Like I have great intentions could be seen as appropriation or co-location. So I'm basically circling around, like I'm not sure where, where I in this position of cultural power should land on these questions because what draws me into something isn't any kind of like intention to save the world as a writer or do something political or stir stuff up. It's like, hey, those words are interesting. And I'm lured in in these other ways. What's it like to be there that I that, that I have to remember? It takes, it's like a second order act for me to remember about the sort of cultural positioning of those other things. That doesn't make me a good person. I'm just saying that's how I come to topics that maybe I don't know if I should write about. I don't know. But, but that race, like, I think that's an excellent, excellent. Um, <laughs> um, so I guess my question is for you all, have you ever been a bad art friend? Um, because I have. And I wonder, well, I don't know about the bad friend part, but I, I guess the, the bigger question is, have you used stories from other people and maybe even other living people that they didn't know you were writing or that you didn't have permission to use and yeah, so let's let's get it out. Julie's nodding, so that's great. <laughs> okay, so as a nonfiction writer, I mean, it's kind of impossible for me not to write about other people um, who are real because they're part of my story, unless I want to be the only character. Um, and I mean, this is complicated, and I think it goes to what Rebecca was saying, where it's different to write things where you're writing them, and it's than it is to publish them. <laughs> And so I've been writing, I've been working on this same book for way too many years and I'm getting really close to finishing it. And it's, uh, it's, it's about uh, like relationships that I had in my twenties. And so it involves a lot of other people. Um, and I'm getting to the point where, um, once the book is the manuscripts completed and I start looking for an agent, I'm going to start contacting those ex-boyfriends <laughs> and saying, Hey, here's the chapter you're in and you want to read it. Um, and you know like give them like let them see it let them give me feedback and say well that's not what i remember or man i really don't want this in there um and then it's up to me to decide what to do with that um at the, at the end of the day memoir in particular is about the narrator's experience and their memory and how they experience the world and so there will inevitably be conflicts between 
what I remember and what someone else remembers. That's normal. Um, that's different from factual like misrepresentation or outright lies. Um, and I think as actually as memoirists, we often lie when we write and we don't realize it right away. And that's part of the re revision process. You have to ruthlessly, ruthlessly ask yourself, where did I lie in here? Um, because we all tell ourselves lies to, you know, make ourselves feel better about something that happened or, or whatever. It's just part of being human. And so that's something I have to wrestle with. I have to wrestle with other people's feelings. Now, some people love being written about and they're, they're thrilled. And some people get mad when they're not in your story. Um, and some people like my dad, who's a central part of this book, I was just talking to him a couple weeks ago and he was like, yeah, I really wish I wasn't in that book, but you know what? It's your book. And he's like, I'm going to be probably embarrassed about some things that are in there. And I'm going to be worried about what my sisters think about things I said or did, but it's your story and that's not my place. Right. So I think, I think that's what a lot of people say, but for me, it's about giving people a heads up if the book ever does, you know, like arrive in print somewhere and make me like fabulously famous and rich, hopefully. Um, so letting them know, giving them at least just an opportunity to have a conversation with me and then um, trying to write from the most authentic and honest place that I can. Um, and a couple of the books I have up here really speak to that too. Um, Tara Westover's Memoir Educated, which was a huge bestseller. Um, she writes about growing up in this fundamentalist, more, uh, well, I don't know if they're Mormon. They're like a rural Idaho, like survivalist kind of family. And her father is this sort of like religious figure. And um, she kind of breaks away from this family, becomes educated, and then writes a book about her childhood. And it's, it's, it's ostensibly about breaking away and becoming educated, but it's really a story about surviving an abusive childhood in a fundamentalist family. And then trying to tell the story when everyone in the family is saying, that's not true, that's not what happened, you're lying. Mm -hmm. So what she does in here that's really unusual is she has all these footnotes mm -hmm. where she says like, my brother, who like one of the brothers she's like, has a good relationship with, she says, he remembers it this way. And this is how he tells the story. Or my mother insists that this never happened and here's what she says. So it's like, she's trying to fact check herself in this way that's very unusual. And some people actually criticized her about that. And they said, you're not trusting your own memory. You're not, um, you're letting your family who has continuously tried to manipulate you, continue to man man manipulate you in print. And so, you know, there's this interesting debate about what she's doing and if it's useful or not. So back to the bad art friend, I kind of veered us away from that. <laughs> um, yeah, well, since I, I, I mean, I can talk about realism a little, like what, when I've done, okay, well, anyway, there's a couple of examples where I think I've, I've used other people's stories. Actually, I do it all the time. And um, because they're fascinating and my life is interesting in the ways that I want to write about. And so I think the biggest example that I can offer for this, um, where I felt anxious, very anxious about this, um, is when, uh, so when I was in my early 20s, I was getting my MFA in fiction writing and I was dating a long-term boyfriend and we had a very idiotic relationship, which is sort of beside the point, but I just want to throw it out there. And so um, we, uh, we were at this much older sister's house. So we're in our 20s, we hung out with this sister and their family, they have a pool, they are established, they are adults. And they're hanging out with um, their, we're hanging out with their neighbors. And so this is at a time in my, in my writing life where I'm very interested in writers like Raymond Carver. And Raymond Carver is um, a, a minimalist writer. There's a lot of focus on sort of what is said and not said in the short story. This is very attractive to me. I'm, I'm learning some of the right and some of the wrong lessons from this and really attuned to dialogue and what's not being said and silences. And as a side note, Raymond Carver is one of these writers along with Theme that we've got going here, who was sitting at like a restaurant counter or something with a friend, writer friend, friend of his, and they noticed something that the waitress was doing, and they each like turned to each other and basically said, Do you want that or can I take it? Meaning, who's going to write about that thing first? Right. So, this is what I mean about 
always taking from the world around you and, and even you know like claiming it to you know establishing terms. So I'm in this hot tub with the my boyfriend at the time, his sister, her husband, and these neighbors from down the street. And these neighbors from down the streets are talking about what seems to be average, ordinary suburban neighbor stuff when they say, we got the coroner's report today. And I'm sort of like, wait a minute, I've heard about what's going on in this neighborhood. And they had just lost their 15-year-old daughter in a bike accident at an intersection. And I don't know these people at all. But all of a sudden, because this is who I am, right? When I when I have my own background um, in rooted in certain other kinds of experiences, hear something like this, I start writer writing it, right? It's sort of like a way of processing stress, I guess. So immediately I'm listening to this at this level where this sounds like a random carver story to me. This has to be written. This is so like ordinary. There are cicadas. This is an Ohio like suburb. This is the most average thing and the most colossal, devastating thing has happened. But it doesn't seem like it. So I couldn't, I couldn't like not write it. So of course I wrote it. And I changed a lot about it. I, I'm not the 22, the character's not the 22-year-old idiot with his boyfriend and all that stuff. It's the I changed the point of view to the, the like neighbor mother in the story and did a lot of fictionalizing, but at the heart of it, there's still a lot of real dialogue. So this gets this gets some traction. I win a fellowship with it. Like so, you know, this is a story becomes when Tom and Georgia come over to swim and change some names in it. Tom and Marianne are the real people. And years later, um, the I had broken up with the boyfriend, but was still friendly with the sister. And she, she's like, I really love your story. The sister said, Can I show it to them? I'm going to show it to Tom and Mary. And I was absolutely petrified because I had taken something that was theirs that wasn't mine. And it was some of the darkest stuff you can take from a human being. But I couldn't, I, it was so like, and it wasn't like it was published and it wasn't exactly verbatim, but it was very much clearly that night. And so I was petrified and I, I didn't know what to do. And I figured they'd sue me or I'd lose my writer card or like, and I just felt bad. And it turned out that they did a very noble thing and they wrote me a letter and they said, you know, we're, we're you know, basically I had preserved the, the solemnity and the difficulty of that moment in a way that had integrity. But also was so I didn't exploit it in a gross way, right? That was when I was 22. I never stopped doing that kind of thing. <laughs> you would think that anxiety would make me stop, but it didn't exactly. It, it didn't license me in any, it didn't embolden me, but it just it was one of those markers where it gave me a little like, okay, this does have an impact. I don't, I don't give people temples, I don't remove myself like that. But I don't know that it's ever any easier to be dealing with materials from people who are really close. I haven't written anything that close like that since, but I don't rule out that I will. And I don't know what I'll do again in the future. So that's my that's my like confession to you that yeah, I went through this and the consequences were strange and needed. And I feel like that's a really common thing I think most writers have to like that. Yeah. So I feel like for me, the thing I wanted to talk about some piece of choice I made that I didn't really think through and kind of wanted it. I was like, I don't know if I should share this, but I will share it with you just in case maybe you can learn something from it. And it is, as Sarah said, it was for me, it was a nonfiction piece. And it was an encounter I had with some friends that turned into neighbors, and it was a very complicated scenario. So basically, we knew these people that had just moved to town the same time that we did, me and my, my partner. And they lived in a hotel and they kept inviting us over. And every time we come over, they tell us these like wild, cool stories about their past. And like, wow, these people are so interesting. And like they're living in a hotel, like it's so interesting. And one night I remember very clearly we left their place, they're sitting in the hotel parking lot in our car, and both of each other like, I think everything they're telling us is a lie. <laughs> and they think that these stories are not true. And so, and this is the thing that I think is a writer thing, a normal person would probably say. Okay, maybe I don't be friends with these people anymore. But me, I'm like, oh my gosh, like what lies are they gonna tell? And can I like catalog them to figure out like what the truth is and like what the deal is? And so instead of like becoming better friends with other people, we just kept hanging out with them and it's like taking notes and like one of the things. And then the thing that happened is we moved to Germany, my partner and I for a year, and we had to sublet our house. And so they ended up living in our house. And during that year, 
one of them was writing a novel, which he said to me, and the novel was a nonfiction, it was like based on a true story of a spy during World War II that like made all these fictional characters and they used them to spy. And so it was really kind of interesting. Like, wow, he's making all these characters. And it was also at the same time, suddenly all these credit cards were opened in my name and a lot of our stuff was in our house. So they really had access to that information. <laughs> like, I don't want to see some of this, like this is really weird. So we moved and while we were abroad, our neighbor died. And so they ended up then living next door to us during <laughs> that house. And the thing that was weird about it was we started getting mail for the dead neighbor. And it was things like, are you opening a credit card? You're actually deceased. <laughs> so I'm like, I actually think these people might be doing something pretty questionable. But they're also still our friends. Like they're, they, they're clearly struggling financially. Their, their dog gets really sick and they don't have a car. So we end up like driving to the vet when they put her down. Like it's, it's like a really complicated scenario. And I feel like through it all, I'm just like wanting them to tell me what is really going on. And towards the end, before they, they end up getting evicted because they haven't paid their rent and they also end up not having water or electricity and coming over and telling us these wild stories about can they run an extension cord because this has happened with the wiring. And we're like, I don't think that's true. But also when you have no power, don't we have don't we kind of owe you something, right? And so there's on one hand the sense of like the person has no power, I want to share with them, but also like, can they just tell me that? Like why are they lying to me? Yeah. And so the essay that I ended up writing is is kind of about that scenario. And it was mostly just because I was trying to figure out what in the world was going on and make sort of peace with the sense that I would never know what was going on. Um, and so I felt like writing about that really helped me kind of figure out the different pieces of it. And it is an essay kind of about like, these are some things about these people, but I don't actually know if any of them are true. So, so here's a story of like, maybe it's completely false. And I think that's something a lot of nonfiction writers do. But then the issue for me, the thing that I think is really, is a choice that was not well thought through, is kind of the same with you, is I sent the story out and I didn't think about that. Like, what would it mean to write an essay about people who are clearly struggling financially and then to have it published and be paid for it? And so when the story came out, I didn't accept payment. And I like, I just didn't ever cash that check, but I still think about it. Like, they could have really used that money. Like, I should have sent it to them. I should have figured out something. I should have thought about, like, where like, the essay is online so you can read it if you want to. I did change their names, but I still am sort of like, you know, those were some choices that I didn't think through because I was thinking about, you know, as a writer, as a young writer who's trying to, like, make a name for myself, I want to like, publish things, I want to, you know, win contests and stuff. But yeah, the, the part of that, I think, is, is something that I think is, is really important to think about. And it's something that I've focused about a lot because I feel like I didn't act necessarily ethically in that situation, even though I was all, honestly just trying to really figure, figure out what was going on and put it aside. You know? I think one thing that we're also just sort of not addressing directly is when you feel like this is a great story. I mean, that's why we're writers. Like, we're like, that's a great story. We've got to tell somebody about it. Or we've got to make it into something else. So for you, that is a great story. Like, and, and, and what you're talking about, like, I'm very curious about, like, where your memoir is going to go and what all it's going to say. And you recognize there's, like, as, as we're talking about these things, like, I have this sort of, it's like there's a special organ in my body that sort of, like, that, like, pulses when I hear a good story, like, yes, that, 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 and I can almost not stop, like, moving forward with wanting to do something with it, so to curtail that urge, right, or to think about all of those other elements outside, what does that do to that impulse, or that thing that drives you to be a good storyteller, right, so what do you, not that we're trying to say we're depriving the public, but there's sort of this energy, like, again, these are different things, a published story versus something you just really want to write, which are, which are different as well. Um, sorry, yeah, I think maybe you can skip this question because I think we've done it. And yeah. Maybe I'll just jump here. We'll so, so, uh, look at the, the consequences of the slides. Or the, if you want to look at that. I'll just really quickly move yeah. to the last one. So I just wanted to show you guys that we are not the first people <laughs> I, to think about what happens when you work with material from real life human beings. Can we go to the book about that Sedaris quote first? So that so David Sedaris, maybe you have heard of David Sedaris. His own relationship to the truth is um, contested, I think, actually. Um, he is a, he, known as a humorist now, uh, more so than a memoirist. And so he writes funny, to put it really bluntly and, and poorly, he writes funny stories about mainly about his family or his loved ones. 
And they are really exquisitely, I personally love his writing. I think he does usually an extremely good job balancing darkness, lightness, grief, um, joy, satire, he's, he's hilarious. But he wrote, there's this really great essay where he, he's writing, you know, it's, it's a memoir essay, it's a short memoir piece about one of his sisters and his relationship to the truth. And he, puts himself in as the writer brother character and as the writer brother and um, his sister's telling a story and it's, and he doesn't, and what's interesting is on the page, he summarizes it. She's like, you can't tell anyone. And then he's like, the story had this, 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 but he doesn't say what it's about. And he's trying to convince her. This is how he's making fun of how debased he is and how immoral he is and how bad he feels. But he's also making, it's also kind of funny. He's trying to convince her, please, please let me put this whole thing in somewhere. And she's crying. This is a terrible story. She doesn't want him to do anything with it. It's probably about a pet. You know, she's very loved animals and all this has to come to the story. And he says, oh, come on, I said. The story is really funny. And I mean, it's not like you're going to do anything with it. And then he realizes your life, your privacy, your bottomless sorrow. It's not like you're going to do anything with it. Is this the brother I always was or the brother I am now? And yet he still publishes all of that in a memoir. And, and, it, and it's actually quite repeat after me. It's like a carrot with some kind of bird that can do that in it. And it's, it's really moving. The other quote I wanted to share with you about writers and how they feel about using this has, comes from Tony K. Bambara. And I'm not going to do justice to reading this, but I'm still going to try a little bit. Um, Tony K. Bambara um, is a writer who uh, was incredible, and I love her collection, Girl of My Love, or short fiction collection. <laughs> and she was this really, so she writes a sort of preface to a girl of my love. So it's like preface, but it doesn't say preface, it's a sort of preface. And it's much longer than this. And it says, it does no good to write autobiographical fiction, because the minute the book hits the stand, here comes your mama screaming, how could you? And sighing death, where is thy sting? And she snatches you up out of your bed to grill you about what was going down back there in Brooklyn when she was working three jobs and trying to improve the quality of your life and come to find on page 49 that you were messing around with that nasty boy up the block and breaks into sobs and quite naturally your family strolls in all sleepy eye to catch the floor, floor show at 5 a.m. But as far as your mama is concerned, it is 1940 something and you ain't too grown to have your ass whipped. So I deal in straight up fiction myself because I value my family and friends and mostly because I lie a lot anyway. <laughs> This is a more humorous take on you know, what it's like to be always suspected of using somebody's stories or maybe how not to use somebody's stories because they will always have an impact. Um, I think at this point we could move to the last thing that we need to talk about maybe, which was the slides. Um, if you want, if you also remember the slides in your book, what um, did you want to talk about? This Oh, well, okay, so I'm going to ask one last question, and if anybody wants to talk about their books that we have got some of their books up on the slides here, we can probably like kind of wrap that together, which is like, how does the genre that you're focusing on, so like I'm kind of here representing creative nonfiction, Rebecca is representing maybe fiction or historical fiction as well, and then Julie, um, speculative fiction, like how does your genre engage with truth? Right, whether we're talking about literal truths or emotional truths. So you guys want to, Julie, do you want to start sure. a little bit about that? Yeah, so I think, I mean, obviously there's a lot of different ways that speculative fiction engages with truth, and it's interesting because you think of it as like science fiction, fantasy, it seems like the most far removed thing from truth there is, but actually it's not, and there are a lot of really cool things that speculative fiction does. Um, that I think are confusing. So one example is speculative fiction that takes an existing real world issue and kind of amplifies it or expands it and kind of plays out of what might happen in the future. So you can think about something like Margaret Atwood's A Handmaid's Tale, which gained a lot of popularity in the last couple of years with the Me Too movement and recent political events. Um, she wrote that in 1985 and people were like, wow, this really predictive things. And basically that was, that's the goal, right? <laughs> She's taking something and saying, okay, you're in the 1980s, this is happening. How might this play out? And then, more the whole, it does kind of play out that way, and it becomes sort of this rallying cry for women's reproductive rights and, and things like that. And one thing that's really nice about speculative fiction is it does kind of defamiliarize and distance itself from the issues that it's related to. So, if you think we're talking about things like women's reproductive rights in contemporary society, 
A lot of those things are linked to specific religions, they're linked to specific political parties. But when you talk about them in the context of the handmade scale, it takes it out of that context. And so one thing makes it easier to talk about is less com sort of combative, I think it feels a little bit less combative because it's not like, oh, your religion does this, or you know, your political party does this, right? It becomes kind of taken up outside of that. And then it also sort of defamiliarizes it, so it makes it something you have to kind of look at differently. And I think it makes people consider issues from perspectives that they might not otherwise. Another thing that speculative fiction often does is kind of have a hypothetical. So thinking about what's a utopia or what's a what, what might be a great society. And Ursula Le Guin is a writer that does this a lot to keep friends, but just possess them kind of an exploration of anarchy and capitalism and thinking about different gender roles. So she basically tries to create a society where you know it's more egalitarian in terms of gender that has more of an anarchist spent and it is i think she calls it an ambiguous utopia which is really interesting it's like it's happy but it's not like too happy <laughs> is it actually um is it a utopia i don't know it's like for debate probably but it asks us to think about what would an ideal society look like how can we think about our own society what changes might we make and then one another option, and there are a lot of different other ones, but one where I wanted to mention because it's one that I kind of love, is this kind of metaphor um, approach to, to fiction. So using things as, as metaphors, so you can think about allegory, stuff like that. And an example I really like is the Matt Bell book, um, and I always mess up the title, but I wrote it down. In the house upon the dirt between the lake and the woods, this is fairy tale. It's told in fairy tale language, and it's basically a metaphor for marriage, right? So it's like you fairy tale story of a couple getting together and they live in the house upon the dirt between the lake and the woods and then the woods become associated with one character and there's like this like falling apart zombie bear and then the lake becomes associated with this other character and there's this like octopus kraken kind of creature and then there's this like finger that's like a kind of a metaphor for a child that they lost and basically I think it's this really cool metaphorical representation of of what marriage is and how difficult it is to describe it. It's like marriage is a landscape and it's complicated and there are different pieces and you know some pieces are, are more associated with one person or the other and some pieces you try to like chuck your way into them and it's really hard to be there. Um, and I feel like it's one of the most accurate depictions of marriage that I've ever read, even though it is completely couched in these really speculative elements. And I think if you tried to tell that story by putting it in terms of like specific people and times, you would lose all of that. It would actually like take away from the center truth. So those are just some examples that I thought of. They're actually not my slides. <laughs> I just realized. <laughs> okay. Okay, sorry. Do you want to talk about both? Sure. So I guess the other thing I just want to say, and I can kind of do this really quickly, is one thing that I love about speculative fiction is it's often really formally experimentative and it does a lot of stuff with language a lot of times and asks you to think about things from different perspectives. So ancillary justice is this really cool. Um, science fiction space opera novel that's told from this first person perspective of a spaceship that is like the center command for a bunch of ancillary soldiers. And so it's told in past and present. And in the past lives, the ship is it, not only like own entity, but it also has third person limited perspectives from all of these ancillaries. And the ancillaries have these like sensory abilities. And so they're able to kind of see what other people that aren't ancillaries can sense. Mm -hmm. So it's this really interesting approach to omniscience, right? It's omniscient, but it's also focused in one identity. And then in the present parts, the ship has been destroyed. There are no more ancillaries, and it's just one ancillary who has all of these memories from like a lot of people and a, and a, and a ship, right? Which is really interesting. And the other thing that's nice about this is that because the ship has a collective experience, doesn't have a sense of gender. So the whole book is told using female pronouns, which if you think about space opera, which is so masculine and so like often there are no women in it at all. And this is a space opera that is just entirely women, right? There's, no, there's not even, I don't think, there are men in it, but they're, the character can't differentiate them, right? So just lots of she with pronouns, which is really a kind of a cool experience. And the same thing with Battle 17, this is a novel about language and the way that kind of changes the way that we think about things. I don't want to give too much away about that, but it's also really experimental in terms of how it's told and also just really inclusive. It's such a joyful book about different perspectives. Really, really great book. It was written in 1966, but so much fun in the way that today. And the last one is really stuff by Nadia Korofor. She's a Nigerian author. And one thing I really love about her is when she talks about writing, she writes nonfiction too. And she says, because of her Nigerian background, it's really hard to think about the world without speculative elements. But if she's writing nonfiction, it has to have ghosts in it because that's kind of.
kind of from a cultural perspective, right? And I really, I'm really curious, I'd like to actually learn more about people who are writing nonfiction and using speculative elements because that reflects their reality more accurately than not. But this is a lot of her books are based in African culture and heritage figures that present you know, contemporary African topics like female gender women relations that often put some of this like, magical world. And the cool thing about this one is that Georgia Martin is actually helping produce it for an HBO series. So it should, I think, hopefully <laughs> become like really well known for a few years. So definitely check that one out if you're interested. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so to address how the genre that I'm talking about um, works with the truth, I chose my two sort of favorite books that of, I guess, historical fiction. Um, and so uh, one of these is E.L. Dr. Charles Ragtime, which is set in 1903. Um, and it's when a prototypical family literally named father, mother, and mother's younger brother, and the boy, that's their names, you know, this um, wasp you know, family, um, they I think they, they manufacture American flags. Um, so that's one kind of family, and they seem really representational when they're meant to be, but they are also um, inhabited on a very empathetic level. You get their thought process, you get sort of the feel for them, but they but there's a sort of detachment um, of, of the voice in the book. Weaving throughout mother, father, and the boy, and mother's younger brother's lives are um, Full House Walker. This is also a musical, maybe you've seen it. Um, Full House Walker and um, linking on his um, on the woman that he loves. Um, he is a uh, African American jazz musician and um, I think ragtime actually musician, and uh, he is at the center of a controversy. And they have a little a little boy too. They're the kind of named unknown characters in the book. And you also have Jewish immigrant family of Tate, uh, Mame, and the girl. Um, so father, mother, and the girl. And they weave in and out of these stories. Along the way, so these are representational immigrant experience and how life works for them. And then Full House Walker, a fictional African-American man who gets there's a middle, there's a big igniting controversy about his model E Ford and the white people in the town who don't think he should have a car that nice, nice, and then it's all kind of blows up and involves everybody. There are, Barry Houdini makes appearances consistently throughout this book. Um, Evelyn Nesbitt, um, Emma Goldman, uh, lots of very, uh, Henry Ford. Um, and so E.L. Yeah, Dr. O goes into the brains of, or seemingly to the brains of these famous people. And it's sort of that Colonel Sanders thing because it seemed like, what would it matter? One of my favorite quotes from that book, actually, who knows if it's true? is Houdini was one of the last great mother lovers, which is not a story like, like Tara was talking about, but it's more of a story of somebody who adored his mother so much, and he was married, you know, but whatever, when she died, he was bereft and wouldn't see to communicate with her past the grave, and then he said that he kind of like love her of seances and stuff. And so that line, anytime I can see anything of Houdini, I'm thinking of a fictional, he a loved her love, her last great mother lover. Like that is how, like, sympathetic and intriguing those characterizations are. And he's really creating this world, which is very rich and is going through um, sort of a snapshot of America and all of the um, myriad issues that are going on at the time with immigrants, with African-American uh, civil rights and with prototypical and stereotypical white family. It is um, both joyful and devastating, but it's meant to be sort of panoramic, almost orchestral. It's got a lot of moving parts to it. The other book that I love from this genre is perhaps the most difficult one in the world, and it is Beloved by Toni Morrison. It is a smaller story, but it is also has an incredible magnitude to it. It's incredibly important. And to write it, um, Toni Morrison went to Cincinnati, Ohio's Margaret Garner, who was a slave that um, escaped from Kentucky across the Ohio River. When I did graduate school in Cincinnati, I lived right near the Ohio River. I had no idea how easy it looks and how small it seems. Like right, right here is free. And then like, you could, it seems like you could just cross it. Like all the literary renditions and plays that are out there to, to you know, there's, there's slavery, there's freedom. Margaret Garner um, was an escaped slave and um, was afraid of going back into slavery and um, committed some acts of violence against her own children and herself to not be recaptured and taken back to Kentucky. 
that's a real case. She was on trial. There was a newspaper article about it. Toni Morrison decided that she didn't want to deal with the real actual story of Margaret Garner and be it presented factually. She very famously said that would be like a recipe that's already baked. And she wanted to be able to explore why a mother would do something like this to her own children and, those, and the concepts of ownership. Do you own your children? You know, are you allowed to do things to them to protect them from somebody else? So it's this really great ethical thing. So she named the character Setha, that's how I say it. I'm never quite sure of the pronunciation. And she explored multiple points of view and she made Beloved Ghost. Beloved is the child, what the child that did end up getting killed in this, uh, in this story. And so we enter the story many years past and our, and our work is to uncover it. Um, Morrison, quickly I'll say, he did a lot of research for this, whereas Doctoro's research is always sort of mythically obscure like you don't really know how much we you know he's like well i didn't research anything and then it was like he did it and whatever and so like i've tried to figure out his process right but tony morrison um to write beloved has said in various interviews that she was trying to figure out how slavery actually worked in people's minds how could you enslave people and she um she's trying to understand slaveholders and she went through implements of slavery and she saw this thing the bit and she realized this is something that was put into slaves' mouths, like a horse's bit, um, for I don't know what purposes, but certainly torture, but other, other, I don't know what the idea was from the slaveholder's point of view. And she said, I realized that somebody had to plan that and get the materials to do that and then make that. And like, like basically stepping back, like all that effort for this thing that's then turned into this, you know, that this isn't just some random, like, I'm gonna control you, here's a stick, but that there's this whole um, industry and thought process and planning devoted to this kind of thing. And that helped her kind of understand it better. So I would say in my, in my field, these are two standouts for totally different reasons. Um, one does a lot of the work and the research and tries to understand from that level of like the capital and, and, and the newspaper. And Dr. O supposedly was just staring at a wall and was wondering like what's behind that wall and who built this wall in my old house and then somehow came up with ragtime. I don't really believe that, but that was one of the things that was telling. <laughs> and that they both end up with these remarkable empathetic um, stories of America and the difficulties of, of being an American in various ways. And they do so, I think, with great heart. Sometimes. Those are my recommendations. Um, yeah, so um, we just got like two minutes left here, and I am not going to recommend the last book that I'm going to talk about, which is James Frey, A Million Little Pieces. Um, this is a book that, this was uh, an Oprah Book Club selection, again, maybe like 15, 20 years ago, and um, it, Oprah, you know, loved this book. She was raving about it. It sold, it sold about three and a half million copies, and then um, this expose came out that basically said like, there is just a whole bunch of stuff in this book that's completely fabricated and made up. And it, it was published as a memoir. Um, this was really at the height of the memoir publishing boom. Um, and he, the book went on to sell another million and a half copies after that, that came, like, came to light. And um, one of the first people to question things in the book was a journalist from the Minneapolis Star Tribune. And she, she talks about the you know, the, the author talks about going through a root canal surgery with no anesthesia. And in the first scene, he's boarding an, air, an, an airplane, uh, a flight, a commercial flight, and he has a hole in his cheek. He's bleeding and his um, clothes are covered with spit, snot, urine, vomit, and blood because he's been, he's a, he's a drug addict and he's been in a fight and he has no memory of this, but he writes this scene. And you know, she, she's like, um, how would a flight attendant let somebody like that board an airplane, right? Like, um, this, this, this just can't possibly be true. It comes, he, you know, and it, he makes a bunch of other claims. Like he says he was in jail for three months when really he was in jail for like three hours. Um, it came to light that he actually tried to publish this fiction. 17 different publishers rejected it. And it was finally picked up by a very well-known editor, Nan Talese. And she said, I want to publish this, but I want to publish this as nonfiction. Mm -hmm. And so he rewrote the book, mm -hmm. um, taking out the, the, the fake stuff, but clearly he didn't. Um, and, you know, there was just a lot of people like up in arms about this. 
why, how did this happen? And, you know, he was blamed and he, you know, really doubled down on his lies. When, if you look at how the book was published, I think you can really blame the industry, which was trying to capitalize on what was popular at the time. But I also think that when you, when you think about what creative nonfiction is, creative nonfiction has this pact with the reader that says, this story is true. And he clearly violated that pact and his publisher violated that pact. On the other hand, another way of looking at creative nonfiction is to say that it's a writer's consciousness on the page. Um, and as someone who was an addict, um, I would say that in a lot of ways, his consciousness was revealed on the page because he believed his own lies, because that's like that. And, and he really did get inside the mind of an addict. Like he had constructed all of these narratives about who he was and he started to believe them. So I think it's a really interesting case to think about, but it's not a book I would recommend. <laughs> Okay, and we are out of time here. We appreciate your attention and thank you for coming.